Hey, welcome everybody in the room, everybody tuning in, wherever you are tuning in from. Ports Live locations, Ports Tulsa, Midland, Indy, Scottsdale, Boise, Houston, everywhere. Welcome, we're continuing this series, His and Hers, and looking at a biblical perspective on dating. Let me start this way. I have been coaching my son's soccer team for the past three years, and we have successfully gone defeated, completely. <laughs> we have not won a game. That is until last Saturday, okay? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That's it, let me close in prayer, okay? Um, so last Saturday we finally had our win, it was four to two. Yes, one of the goals that made up our four was actually scored by the other team on themselves, but that doesn't matter because we still would have won it three to two. And I've noticed something when I coach six-year-old, five-year-old, and four-year-old soccer that happens every single game without fail. Midway through first quarter, second quarter, happens all throughout the game, one of the kids on the team will run up to me and just do this. And he looks at me and he's stretching out his foot and he's showing my shoes untied. And so I say, hey, ref, time out, bend over, tie his shoe, try to double knot it. Inevitably, it'll come undone. And they almost like rotate on who's gonna have an untied shoe throughout the game. And if you're six and five, it's normal because a six-year-old, they, they can't tie their shoe. It's, it's too complicated, which is why they often are you know, wearing Velcro shoes, which apparently have come back, which is so bizarre. But anyways, this will happen, and, and it's normal. I mean, there's things that you, at some point, couldn't tie your shoe, and you had to have a, a grown-up or an adult come in and help you tie your shoes. And that is just one of very or many things that you have outgrown and as you have grown in life, you have put behind you is no longer in your past. The things from your childhood, the things you used to play with, the way you used to think, the person you were, the things that mattered, your perspective on the opposite sex, it changes as you grow up. And I start there because the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he's talking about love. And at the end of this section on love, he brings up a very similar idea that's relevant to where we're going tonight and to this idea of outgrowing from childhood. In other words, if you tomorrow at work, someone came up to you and just like the six-year-olds on my soccer team, they extended your foot in front of you and they were like, hey, can you help me tie my shoe? And it's your coworker or your friend at work. You'd be like, are you serious? This is bizarre because you know and understand we grow out of things. And the Apostle Paul talks about love and as he ends that section, he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. It's a very simple idea. And so maybe you're wondering, what does that have to do with dating? Well, I think most of the challenges and problems in dysfunctional dating relationships that are represented in this room, maybe are a part of some of your story and some of my story, are the result of never growing out and putting the ways of childhood behind you as it relates to dating. In other words, you no longer you know, have to have somebody else tie your shoes and a million other things that you have grown out of, but it seems like dating is the one arena across the board in society where we revert to childish ways of thinking and living. And now we don't call it childish and dating and nobody's ever told you, hey, you know what, the problem with all the different broken relationships you have is it's just too childish. So it's childish dating. We have another term that we use to describe someone behaving childish and dating. And it's this word. It's complicated. <laughs> oh man, dating, it's just, it's complicated. Are you and her, like are y'all a thing? It's complicated. What happened? You guys were like together and then, did y'all break up? It's complicated. Now, why do I say that's childish? Well, if you take something that is designed for an adult and you give it to a child, they will say, it's too complicated. You take shoes that are meant to be tied and you hand it to a six-year-old, a child, and they'll go, it's, it's too complicated. And for whatever reason, as it relates to dating and love and relationships, the reason we describe it as complicated is because of childish ways of thinking. 
even as Paul lays out, hey, here's what it looks to have a mature perspective on love, which is what he says in 1 Corinthians 13. And he, he lists out, which is where the verse that I read a second ago ends. He says, love is patient. Here's a mature perspective on love. Love is kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not proud. Love doesn't dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, but in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. When I was a child, I thought like a child, talked like a child, reasoned. I became a man and put those ways behind me. And you think about childish behavior, it's, you know, they're not patient. If you've ever been around nieces, nephews, younger kids, I mean, they're anything but patient. They throw temper tantrums. They, they lose control if they don't get what they, what they want. They're selfish, childlike behavior. And that's really what leads, that type of behavior in adults in dating relationships leads to us describing something that God doesn't want to be complicated as it's complicated. So here's what I wanna to do tonight. Last week we opened up and talked about, hey, these are three things to consider before you start dating. Tonight, for those of us in the room that are in a good place spiritually, with the Savior, with our Lord, we know Jesus, we're following him, we're not perfect, but we are interested in honoring him in our dating relationships and in a place where we feel like we could date I want to uncomplicate dating. We're gonna look at 10 things, so I'm gonna fly. But if you've ever wanted to have a dating relationship that is described not as complicated, but as healthy and life-giving and leading to a particular destination, this is for you. And so we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes on uncomplicating dating uncomplicating dating. Before I do, if you are new or maybe not that familiar with the Bible, this may surprise you, but the Bible not a single time mentions dating. There's no occasions where it describes, you know, Joseph was picking up Mary on the camel and they were headed to Olive Garden and this is what happened there. Because <laughs> dating is a relatively new invention. It's only been around 150 years, 100 years around the same amount of time as the automobile. And so I wanna fly through even some of the history to put into context the history of dating, and then we're gonna launch into 10 things to uncomplicate your dating relationships. So dating was first used, it first appeared in literature in 1896. So this is just a brief history of even dating, how long it's been around, what it has involved. In 1896, it was used to describe in a slang way or a slang reference for prostitution. Going on a date was a euphemism for paying for sex. At that time, you didn't go on a date. Arranged marriages happened, or you would court someone in front of their parents at their parents' home. And as society began to change, that began to change. By the 1900s, courtship had switched into dating, and by 1930s, the invention of the automobile took relationships outside of the home. And dating became more and increasingly more and more normal. Even the invention and advent of makeup is beginning to take place and be partaken in widely at this time. Around the 1930s, men would call on a girl and he would ask her to go out on a date. In the 1940s, the prevalence skyrocketed. It became the most common way that people would end up marrying someone around. A man would pick up a girl, drive her in the car, go on a date, and here we go. By the 1950s, the term going steady began to be used to describe not just going on dates, but hey, I am exclusively dating this person. In the 1960s, everything dramatically changed. Sexual revolution, which you may or may not be familiar with, but in the course of a short number of years, sex and the way that the American perspective on sexuality drastically changed. The invention and introduction of reliable birth control and the passing of Roe versus Wade took away the consequences of sex. And in particular, it allowed sex to be taken outside of the context of marriage, and it became coupled with dating. In the 1970s, Playboy comes onto the scene, begins to alter and transform along with Hollywood and different perspectives, even how feminine beauty was perceived. By the 1980s, the internet 
is introduced, providing further outlets for sex appeal. Pornography comes along. By the 1990s, you have movies, music, Hollywood, which all play significant roles. The explosion of the rom-com in the late 90s. And then by the 2000s, we have the smartphone and dating apps. And people are meeting more online than ever before. So that's a brief history. But unlike certain arenas where over time we seem to be getting better, that doesn't appear to be the case in dating because it's complicated. And in our world, it feels like everywhere you look, everyone would describe it as just, it's a pain, it's brutal, it's something that is not done well. And God doesn't want that to be the case for you. And so we're going to look at 10 principles that are really taking 1 Corinthians 13 and the biblical commands to love, consider, honor, and care for one another and walk through how to apply those in a dating context. Y'all ready? So I'm going to fly. First one, don't date just for fun. Don't date just for fun. This shouldn't need to be said, but what I don't mean is don't have fun in dating. You can have fun, should have fun in dating, but don't date just for fun. In other words, if you are dating someone with no purpose and no intention and no desire and no plan and no foreseeable marriage in your future at all, you're just dating because you're bored and you want attention from the opposite sex, you should not be dating. That's childlike thinking. And you're, you're a follower of Jesus. You're, you're putting the ways of childhood behind you. You're embracing a mature perspective on love. And it is not a mature or honoring thing to play with someone's heart and mess with their emotions and lead them on a journey if you have no intention of moving towards a destination with that person in that relationship. Dating, as I've said before, it's a path, like you're walking on it, that should lead to a place where there's a promise. That's you, white dress, him, black tuck, standing in front of each other, saying I do. That leads to a lifelong pursuit, path, promise, pursuit. If you are on that path and you are aimlessly and going nowhere, you are not ready to date. That's childlike thinking. But we as followers of Jesus, we have a mature. So we see dating, dating is not just something for fun. Dating is meant to lead to a destination of marriage and that informs how I continue in a relationship if I'm going to or if I see this relationship needs to end because it's not progressing. In other words, dating is like going to the airport. No one in the history of history has ever said, you know what, I'm bored this weekend. What do you say we go hang at the airport? <laughs> well, you're not going anywhere, you're not flying. I know, it's awesome. They got like the Annie Ann's pretzels in there and everything's four times as expensive as it is in the normal world and we could just hang around and it'll be great. You've never heard anybody say that, why? Because you only go to the airport as a step to get you towards your destination, dating is something that you only go towards as a step to get you towards your destination. If you're not ready or marriage is off the table and that is something you don't have any interest in or in the next 18 or so months, you would say, man, I just have no interest. I'm completely opposed to getting married in the near future. Then you shouldn't be dating. Proverbs chapter four says that you are to guard your heart and you take the scriptural principles from 1 Corinthians 13 of, hey, love honors the other person. It is not honoring to lead someone on with no intent of seeing that lead to a destination of marriage for Christians. It's been said that dating without the intent of marriage is like shopping with no money. You either leave frustrated or taking something that doesn't belong to you. It's like you going to the mall and walking around Nordstrom's or going to whatever store you are and you're like, man, I don't have any money. You're either gonna be tempted to steal something that doesn't belong to you or you're just going to leave frustrated. And so is the case with dating. That dating is not something that we as believers in Christ do just for fun. As I said, don't date forever. It's my opinion that if getting married in the next 18 months is something you are totally opposed to. I'm not saying you're guaranteeing it has to happen, but you're going, man, I just have no interest in getting married anytime soon. Then you should have no interest in dating anytime soon, and that's okay. All right, number two. We've said this before, but it's worth repeating, and candidly, I wish I could spend an entire message just on this one. Men, ask women on dates. Ask women on dates. Now, here, here, let me, let me, yeah, I saw that coming. Woo, yeah! Um, 
If there is a godly girl, and you know her as a godly girl, and how, now I'm not saying a stranger, I mean a godly girl, and you're a godly guy, and you have interest in dating, you're gonna go up to her, and you are going to ask her on a date. When you do, you're gonna use the word date. You're gonna give specific plans. You're gonna go up to her and say, hey, Marissa, I would like to take you on a date. This next Saturday, <laughs> Marissa, she is pumped. In fact, stand up, Marissa, and we'll have everyone know where to go. Okay. You're going to go up to her, and you're going to give a specific plan and intention. You're going to have thought it out. You're going to have a plan. You're going to go, Marissa, I'd like to take you on a date this Saturday to a Mavericks game. Afterwards, I'd like to go to dinner or before. You're going to show her, I put time, I've thought about it, I have a plan, and I'm going to give her an out. If you can't do it or you're not interested, that's okay. You honor her by giving clarity, and you're allowing her to evaluate and decide what you're asking her. In other words, you're not just going to say, you know, you got anything going on Saturday? Or are you in town next weekend? Or text her W-Y-D. You're gonna <laughs> ask her, I would like to take you on a date. And this is speaking to the guys who this is a godly girl in your life. And there's a lot of them, candidly. I, I wish like, I, I could just get all the guys who are, are at a place and they're interested in dating and get together and charge you up and say, man, ask a godly girl on a date that you know. Not a beautiful girl that you know. So if you don't know her, you don't know if she's godly. You just saw her and like the way that she looks. I'm saying a godly girl that you know and have a relationship with and you go up to her and is it gonna risk rejection? Yes. And girls, you just need to know this. Guys, we don't like to risk rejection. We want to, as best we can, self-protect. But men, you are next level. You're mature love. You're not childish. Kids are afraid of you. They're gonna be childish. You're a man. You're gonna go up and you're gonna risk rejection. And you know what may happen? She may say no. And if she does, I am so proud that you honored her, you honored God, you brought clarity to the relationship, and you did it right, regardless of what she says. And you ask women on dates. Now, to the ladies, number three. Women, say yes to dates. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Good night, everybody. All right. The, um... <laughs> Here, let me, let me unpack what I mean, because I'm not just saying say yes to anybody. I'm saying you say yes to a date, not W-Y-D, not you up, not want to watch Netflix on Saturday. You say yes to a date, and if a guy comes up to you and he asks you, and I mean a godly guy, and it's my opinion, if a godly guy asks you on a date, I would say yes to a date. I wouldn't die on that hell, I'm just giving my opinion. But if a godly guy comes up to you, or someone asks you on a date, or someone asks you, hey, are you in town next weekend? You look at them and say, are you asking me on a date, or just interested in my schedule? <laughs> and you force him to drive clarity into that relationship, or into what he is asking. And you don't allow anyone to treat you with dishonor. That you force, hey, are you... What are you asking me on? Is it okay for girls to ask guys on dates? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> y'all, y'all, there's something else tonight, man. <laughs> sure. There's no biblical verse that would prohibit that. In my opinion, I don't think that's best, and here's why. Because God has called and gives the husband, which he's not your husband, the responsibility to lead and love and serve, and leadership biblically is servant, or being a servant, a chief servant. And the, part of the reason I, I think that's not ideal in my opinion is it could increase and create a culture that increases passivity on men. And God is calling men, men, just like with women, not to be childish. We put, remember, we put the ways of childhood behind us. We can tie our shoes, we can learn how to date, like mature followers of Jesus. And so in my opinion, it's not ideal, but there's no thou shall not ask a guy out. I just don't think it is ideal, and men, man, tonight may be your chance. You step up, you find Marissa, or whoever she is, and you <laughs> go. All right, number three, or number four, I'm sorry. Communicate intentionally. Communicate intentionally along the path at the first date, along the dating relationship as it progresses, not intensely, 
Not first date, hey, you know, I'd like to have 17 children and one of them would be Jeremiah and the other one would be Nehemiah and the other one, no, you don't do that, bro. That's a, that is a recipe for no second date. You communicate intentionally and thoughtfully, I'd like to take you on a date. And then uh, along as the relationship progresses and you communicate intentionally, and here's a big one, ready? Honestly. In other words, when that date is finishing up, and let me talk to guys and girls, when the date is finishing up, if you don't wanna take her on a second date, you don't say, I'll call you, or I'd like to take you on a second date. You, you don't lie. I mean, this is pretty one-on-one stuff, but we often, because we're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings, it just kind of slips out, but you, you're, you're a follower of Jesus, you don't lie. Liars lie. You're not a liar. You're a follower of Jesus. And so if that's not true, then you, you don't say that. And girls, same with you. That if he says, I had a great time, I really would like to take you on a second date. If you don't want to, or you're not sure, you say that. I'd love some time to think about it. You don't lie. You don't ghost and say, yeah, great. And then for six months, you're just disappeared. You're a follower of Jesus, and we put the ways of childhood behind us. And so we communicate honestly and intentionally along the way. As the relationship progresses, and at some point it moves from a date to dating, you go from noun to verb. You're going to have to have what's called a DTR. We can't spend a ton of time here, but you're going to define the relationship, and you're going to sit down. And if along that journey, you, either side, either party, begins to go, I just don't think this relationship should continue, you communicate that, and you honor them. We're so afraid of hurting someone else's feelings, and we think it's wrong if I hurt someone's feelings. If you are sharing the truth and loving them, you are honoring them by not wasting and dragging something on and not uh, suggesting, well, they can't handle the truth. No, you honor them and you share what is true. You sit them down at some point if the relationship progresses and guys, you can initiate. Here's where I see this relationship going. I don't know that we're gonna get married, but you at least have a lot of the characteristics of someone that I would like to marry. And I'd like to continue pursuing you and make you exclusively my girlfriend. And you use the word girlfriend. That doesn't matter to you. May not matter to every girl, but you're driving clarity into the relationship of who you are, where I see this going. And you just honor one another throughout the entire process as the relationship continues. The scripture said, we just read it, love rejoices in the truth. And we don't lie. Number five, we don't play games. Games are for children. You're not a child. You're a follower of Jesus who's embracing a mature perspective on love. And this is, this is big. Nobody in the room probably is like, yeah, I'm a big game player, big gamer. Well, in other ways, maybe they do that. But as it relates to dating, here's what this looks like. And we've been so bombarded by such childish ways of thinking. And we don't even recognize them as childish. We recognize them as, honestly, uh, how you do it. Like, if, if they text you, you wait like 15 minutes before they text back. And if they wait 20 minutes, then you wait 25 minutes, and you just, you, you continue to not show too much interest. I gotta play a little hard to get. I mean, some of you, candidly, you've been so brainwashed by the world around us that if he honors you, communicates well, is intentional in his words, tells you the truth, responds in a way that's actually consistent with his reality, it's like, oh, oh man, ah, oh, I don't know. Uh, that is weird, that's weird. That's childish. That's, that's, that is childish thinking. And I'm not here to throw shade. I'm here to say, man, you, you have it. You've got what it takes. And you're gonna honor one another. You're not gonna play games and lead people on. The scriptures say, the reason why we play games, play hard to get, don't wanna seem desperate, make them work harder, is control. We wanna feel like we're in the driver's seat. We're afraid of being vulnerable. We're afraid of being hurt. We're afraid of rejection. So I wanna have control. Self-protection. In 1 Corinthians, the verse we read, it says love is not self-focused, self-centered, self-protecting at the expense of the other person. That you don't play games and you don't tolerate somebody who plays games. The saying of, man, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, is so appropriate inside of dating that if you embrace worldly ways of thinking 
it leads to worldly pain and worldly types of relationships. And remember, we put those away, the ways of childhood behind us, the adage of don't hate the player, hate the game. For us, it's been you don't date the player and we don't play games. All right, number six. (laughs) Keep sex out of the relationship. Keep sex out of the relationship. God designed and created sex. He's so for it. And he gave this incredible gift for the context of marriage. And if that's something that has been a part of your story and like me have sexual sin in your past, God isn't done with you. But when you think about the future and the love story he's going to write, maybe the love story he is writing, you want it to include, man, I'm keeping sex saved from marriage. I'm prioritizing or I'm pursuing, even if, even if you haven't in the past, going forward, I'm going to. Hebrews chapter 13, verse four says, marriage should be honored by all. The marriage bed should be kept pure. Here's what's interesting about sex. If you talk about complicating, sex, as I said last week, it doesn't make strong relationships. Sex makes babies. And sex doesn't bring clarity in a dating context. It complicates it. Because... God created this amazing gift to be so powerful that it would be intoxicating, uh, like alcohol or like a substance that intoxicates. In other words, the scriptures say in Proverbs chapter 5, he's discussing marriage and he says, may your fountain always be blessed. May you always rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, graceful deer. May her breasts satisfy you always. Ready? May you be ever intoxicated with her love. Would you be drunk in her love? Beyonce didn't come up with drunken love. King Solomon came up with drunken love. And he said, would you always be drunk in your wife's love? That's what I just said, that sex, it's intoxicating. In other words, the reason it's dangerous in a dating context is it decreases your ability to accurately evaluate, is this the type of person that's gonna make a great mom, that's gonna make a great husband, that's gonna make a great father, that I want to marry. Does this person have the characteristics of someone God says to marry, or have we just introduced sex, and had we not, this relationship would have broken up at three months. But now it's been three years, because we introduced a soul tie. What's a soul tie? It's God's design for sex would be that it impacts the most intimate, soul-level part of you. And we introduced that, and it's like, man, we're connected. And God, who loves you, wants you to experience all the amazing gift of sex, but in the context of marriage. It's like this. My friend Trey is going to come up here, and let me show an illustration of what it does. I don't know if y'all had in driver's ed something called drunk goggles. You remember these? They still exist. Maybe some of you had them, some of you didn't. This simulates... The perspective of somebody, hey, give it up for Trey. Can we say thank you to Trey? Here we go. Looking sharp, dapper. All right. Trey, I want you to just catch one of these balls. No pressure. Just without it. On. Okay. Now put the goggles on. And this simulates someone being intoxicated. And now let's see what happens. Okay. Good try. Okay. That's all right. There we go. Man, this is it's not going... Okay, man, it's swing and a miss. Okay, there we go. My point is, immediately you introduce that. Thank you, Trey. Give it up for Trey. All right. <laughs> Something that was so simple all of a sudden became so complicated and complex and difficult. And when you introduce sex into a relationship, it doesn't bring clarity. It makes things more complicated because it's introducing this powerful force that God said it's, it's, it's intoxicating. Like, you think, man, you're in love, and we're married in God's eyes, and I think they're the one. No, you just had sex, and they don't have the character that God says to look for. But it, you're under the influence of bringing that into the relationship. It's my opinion. This is just my opinion. I would delay any sort of physical interaction as long as possible. Certainly sex. But I'm talking kissing, making out, and I know I, right now I just lost everybody. I'm like, okay, it's official. David does not live in the real world with the rest of us humans, lives in some closet back there and never comes out except on Tuesday nights. <laughs> I have never heard a couple say, you know, our one regret in dating is we just didn't make out enough. And you know what's not happening when you're making out? 
you're not learning anything about them other than like what they just ate for dinner. <laughs> it's just my opinion. I would delay it as long as possible and consider maybe towards marriage, until marriage. Okay, I gotta keep moving. Number seven. Oof, man. I wanna be very clear on every word I'm about to say. And don't clap. <laughs> you don't need deep friendships or relationships with someone of the opposite sex. Now let me, okay, yeah, I saw that coming. <laughs> now let me, let, me, let me clear it up. Let me, let me make sure you hear what I'm saying. Hey, if you're dating someone, you should have a friendship. Healthy marriages are built on friendships together. What I am saying is very intentional every word. You don't need. If you need lots of deep friendships, if you're a girl with lots of guys, of the opposite sex. Those are your go-to. Those are the closest people you have. Those are, if you need that, that, there's something not right there. If you're a guy and you need that, the closest emotional connections and who you talk to when it's a hard day and who you lean on is not other guys in your life because you're a guy, it's other girls in your life. I just think it's unwise. And so let me be very clear on why I'm saying all of that. It introduces potentially a, a friendationship. In other words, man, I've been doing this 12, 12 years at the porch. And every relationship between a guy and a girl, and somebody's gonna email me, I know, and somebody's gonna come down front and be like, this is Charlotte, I'm Steve, we're best friends. That's gonna happen. In my opinion, I've seen it over and over and over. One of the people in that close, hey, this, we're so close. One of the people is like, oh, dude, she's straight friend zone, there's nothing. And she's over there going, yeah, I'm friend zone, but I would love to not be. And maybe over time, you know, we're gonna look up and go, man, I've loved you. And they've thought that or they have some inkling of that. that it just is unnecessarily playing with fire. And you're called as a Christian. Remember, we put childish ways behind us to honor the other person and to seek to be considerate of the other person. And some of us in the room, just if you were honest, man, you... you you have lots of those relationships and emotional, flir emotionally flirtatious relationships, emotionally borderline dating relationships, and you, you even have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. But you turn to those to fill some insecurity or some itch or to scratch something that may reflect something that's not healthy. And here's my full disclosure. Again, this is my opinion. I don't think a guy and girl can have a deep platonic Friendship. It's just my take, my take, my opinion, that a deep, nothing there without something in someone's heart potentially getting misled. But you don't need lots of those types of relationships. And ladies, here's the other thing. Some of the guys in the room, you just may be naive. Like, I was naive for so many. I look back, and I just was an idiot, like, in college. I just, my prefrontal cortex had not developed or something. Like, I, I remember I was taking a girl on a date, and she was like, oh, I don't think that we can. I mean, you're dating my friend. And I was like, what? I'm not dating your friend. I had no idea what she was talking about. She was like, oh, you know. And I was like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. She stepped outside, called this girl, and she was like, she's gonna come over. I'm leaving. And I was going, I have no idea who is about to come over right now. Like zero, <laughs> zero idea. I go outside of my house on the front porch, and I look, and... <laughs> And I just, it's like a movie scene. This, this truck or car pulls up and I just see the car lights and I'm like, I have no idea. I mean, I have no idea who's about to come out of this car right now. And the silhouette of a person walks up and she was like, yeah, I thought we were dating. <laughs> Which it maybe is equally on her. I thought you were interested in putting that out there. And sometimes it's just guys un naively when you're hanging out or you're texting her or you're asking her about her day or you're asking, hey, do you want to come with me to that Mavs game? She doesn't see it as you're a big Luca fan, me too. She sees it as, I think he's asking me on a date or something is going on there. And so it may be just a reflection of naivety. I just would have proceed with caution. Right, number eight, invite outside counsel. Invite outside counsel. Don't isolate the relationship. Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel. If you have plans to get married, have a successful dating relationship, honor each other and date well. Those types of plans fail for lack of counsel or wise counselors, but with many advisors, they succeed. That 
you decide, you wanna complicate dating relationships? If you wanna complicate it, then you and her, you just go off and as soon as you start dating, you only hang out with each other, you're never around other people, you just become the couple that totally isolates. But if you wanna have uncomplicated dating, you're gonna involve your community group. You're gonna involve trusted followers of Jesus in your life. You're gonna ask, hey, is there anything that you see or any hesitations you have on this relationship continuing going forward? Do you think I'm in a good place to date? You're gonna ask questions like that. You're gonna involve and invite outside counsel to speak into that relationship as a protection for you and for them. Proverbs 18, chapter, Proverbs chapter 18, verse one says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. That if you're the only person who likes your relationship, or you and her, that should be a red flag. And you're gonna invite outside counsel. All right, number nine. Don't be afraid to break up. If at some point along the dating relationship, you find yourself confident this relationship shouldn't move forward or in a season of doubting and questioning and really wrestling or identifying characteristics that give you pause and concern, don't be afraid to end the relationship. But when you do, you're gonna honor one another and how you do that. You're gonna go in person. You don't break up. Uh, no relationship should be ever broken up through text messaging or any other form of digital communication that includes emojis, okay? You're gonna go in person and do what Philippians chapter two said, which is do nothing out of selfish ambition, but with humility, consider the interests of others more important than yourselves. You are going to put the interests in this other person before yourself and you're gonna communicate and you're gonna sit them down and you're gonna say, thank you for the time and ways you've invested in this relationship, or if you're the guy, you're gonna say, hey, I have really enjoyed, or say whatever's true. Thank you for taking the time to go on the dates we have been on, for the relationship that we have had. I no longer feel confident moving forward and need to break up our relationship. If you're the girl, you're gonna sit him down and you're gonna say whatever's true and honor them. Thank you for taking me on dates in the way that you have cared for or the way you have led, communicated, whatever is true. And you're gonna look them in the eye and share, I, as I've processed, been praying, maybe you share with your community group, I'm no longer comfortable moving this relationship forward and need to break up. And you honor them. You don't blame God. You don't go up to them and be like, look, I just think God is telling me we need to break up. I mean, think about how many times that's done and God is in heaven being like, no, I didn't. No, no, that's, that's just him. He just doesn't, no. You don't blame God. You say, I'm not comfortable. And it, uh, the thing that's hard is as Christians, we don't like hurting people's feelings. We're afraid of that, but you're honoring them by saying it would be unloving and dishonoring to continue going forward in a relationship I don't see moving forward. And so I'm gonna to choose to honor you and breaking up is hard, but can I just tell you this? If you will actually do the uncomplicated dating, it won't be easy because breaking up is never easy, but your breakup won't break you because you have protected your sexuality, you have sought to honor them along the way, you've communicated honestly and clearly along that journey, you haven't played games, remember kids play games, you're a follower of Jesus, you've told the truth. And it won't be easy, because it's never easy. But it is something that God will get you through, and it won't break you, like so many breakups do, when you date childishly. Finally, we understand, number 10, that marriage is ultimately about Jesus. If you want to uncomplicate dating, we make it so complicated, and there's so many fields, and what am I thinking, what's he thinking? As it relates to dating as a path to a promise on an altar, that's a wedding, to a lifelong pursuit, that's a marriage, I understand that at the end of the day, the thing that marriage is about is the same thing life is about, which is Jesus. 
and knowing Jesus and being in a covenant relationship. I'm gonna explain that in a second with Jesus. The marriage at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about, life is not about you and finding love and living happily ever after and Prince Charming, that life at the end of the day, and it's easy for me, you're married, it's easy for you to say, if you wanna have an uncomplicated dating relationship, you have gotta be informed that marriage is not about just that marriage. It's ultimately a picture that is intended to point us to how God loves and keeps his promises to his people. So Paul defines it as. In other words, it's like marriage is a picture. This is a picture that sits on my desk. It's my wife from the day that we got married. And it's a beautiful picture. It's an awesome picture. I love this picture. But you know what is so much better than this picture? Her. Like physical, breathing, living her. Her. That a picture is nothing, it pales in comparison to the person. And marriage is meant to be this picture that points to ultimately the person of Christ and his love, his covenant. Covenant is a relationship and a entered into bond that ends in death do you part, or only ends in death, or in Christ eternally has been set. For anyone who believes in Christ, in other words, Paul would say in, first, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter five, he's describing marriage. I read these words at every wedding I've ever done. And he says something profound about marriage. He says, for this reason, talking about marriage, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And when this happens, something crazy happens. The two become one flesh. Man, how does that happen? You've got two people that yesterday was Sam and Sarah and now is one flesh And then he says, this is a profound mystery. And up to that point, you're like, yeah, man, that is profound. Two becoming one. And then he takes a turn. But I'm talking about Christ and his church. Paul is saying, hey, the reason God is so passionate about marriage, the reason marriage and that covenant and that marriage is a death do us part, we are in it for the long haul, for better or worse, that God is so passionate of our understanding of marriage, it's because he says it ultimately is meant to point, every human earthly marriage is meant to point and be a small reflection of the point of marriage, which is his covenant-keeping love and relationship with his bride, which is the body of Christ. Ultimately, it is a picture, and it is only in knowing that picture that you understand, hey, just like God never gives up, never abandons, never walks away. He runs towards me, despite the fact that I don't deserve it. That's how I am to love and serve my wife, like Christ has loved and served me, laying down his life. That's how I'm to love and serve my wife. And she understands, hey, just like Christ loved and served, I'm to prioritize and serve and love and put the needs of the other person in front of me. And if you don't understand that, you've got a childish way of thinking about marriage. Fairy tales are fun to read, but they're, they're childish. Our understanding of marriage is so much more beautiful and profound. And it comes from an understanding that in Christ, anyone who's accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they've trusted in him as the payment on their sin. 2,000 years, you may have never heard of this before. Jesus showed up, God in human flesh. He walked on the planet and he went to a cross and he died on behalf of every person who has ever lived, every sin in your present, everything you don't even want to ever share with the person that you're dating, everything in your past, everything in your future, all of it, on a cross, he said, I will be killed and crucified and die so that they will have a payment for their sin. And anyone who trusts in what he did on the cross, not I'm trusting in, man, I'm a good person, pay my taxes, try to be nice, I give to homeless people from time to time, I, you know, I read my Bible, I'm sure God and me are good. Nope. <clears throat> wrong answer. The Bible says there are no good people. You cannot be good enough to reach eternity or to go to heaven, but you don't have to. Jesus came and died in your place. Everything wrong, everything broken, every relational dysfunction, every type of sin in this life and in my life paid for. And when you trust in him, you are now entered into this eternal, unstoppable, unending covenant with Jesus alongside of the people of God, that's followers of Jesus. Ultimately, what marriage is all about. If I could boil down and really when it comes to dating, Paul is just 
expanding what it means to be loving, to honor, to care, to understand the value and worth of somebody else. And in a culture that is so toxic, as followers of Christ, we know the value of our life and the value of those that we date and are around and every person sitting next to you and every person you'll ever date, every person that will be married here. My wife and I were buying, I'll close here, we were buying a mattress like two years ago. We just had gone through and it had been eight years. It just was time to get a mattress. And it was COVID and so we decided we were gonna try one of these online, you buy the mattress and they mail it to your doorstep. And they come with these guarantees that if you don't like it, you can sleep on it for 180 days or extended amount of time. And if you don't want it, you can have a 100% money back guarantee. It's like, man, that feels like no risk. Let's do it. And we purchased this mattress. And like three days in, it just was like, man, it's too it's uncomfortable. This is not for us. I call up the company and say, hey, we want to exchange. We want to take you up on the money back guarantee, the refund. And they said, okay, great. We will refund you and you are only responsible to take the mattress and donate it to a Goodwill or donate it to some sort of second hand. You just have to donate it to somebody. And I was going, wait a second. You're not even coming to pick up the mattress? We just have to get rid of it? And they're like, yeah, you just have to send us a proof of receipt that you donated it to somewhere. And I remember thinking, because we slept on it for three days, it's now of so little value to you that it's not even worth your time to pick up or send somebody to get it. And what's so sad is so many of us have lived in a world where that's how people think about sexuality. Hey, I'm damaged goods. I've been slept with or they've slept with somebody or as it relates to sleeping on something or sleeping with something in the same way that that mattress was like, man, it's damaged goods. It's not worth anything to us. That's how people will think about themselves. That's how people will think about other people. That's how people treat other people in their life. It's not that big of a deal. It's something to sleep with. That is such an offense to God who would come and die in your place because the value you have is so great. He would lay down his own life. You're not damaged goods. God is not done with you yet. And he wants to uncomplicate your dating life and lead you to experience more and more of what he calls the abundant life and walking in step with him, the point of marriage and the point of life. It turns out life is not that complicated. It's to know him and then go help make him known to a world that needs it. Let me pray. Father, I pray for anyone in this room who's carrying shame and guilt you would speak tenderly to the heart whisper against lies lies that say what defines them is their brokenness lies like their damaged goods lies that they'll never and could never have any type of healthy dating relationship or healthy marriage or healthy future and I pray that you would lead us, God, to whatever is the right next step as we think about dating or maybe there's a relationship that we just, we know it's, it's time to end it. You'd help us. I pray that you'd just unleash men and women in this room. They would just honor one another. They leave hearing nothing else but honor one another and honor God as they do so. That that would happen. So help us, God, to put the ways of childhood behind us and follow our Savior, and live out mature love. For your name and your glory, amen.